How's it going everybody? Today I wanted to go over how to build a toboggan. Now I've built a couple of these toboggans now and although it's not a difficult process to do, it's definitely one of those things that uh, has a lot of variables to it that if you don't get them right you're gonna end up with nothing but a bunch of broken pieces in your trash can. And to avoid that, I'm going to go over a couple of things that you'll need to know before you start the process. Now, I've already gone over the process of how to build a steam box that you're going to need if you're going to do this project. And so if you're interested in that, I'll be leaving a link to that down in the description and also at the end of this video. After you get your steam system set up, you'll have to figure out what kind of material you're going to use for this toboggan. One of the biggest considerations you'll have whenever you're trying to steam bend anything is that you're going to want your lumber to be as green as possible. Most lumber that you buy is going to be somewhere between 6% moisture and a 10% moisture, but you're going to want to go much higher than that. Anything over 14 would be reasonable. But basically, you want something that is as green as possible. If you have any local sawmills near you, that is the best place to get this kind of stuff. Ask them if they have anything that has been freshly cut, and that will give you the best result. The next thing you want to focus on is what kind of wood you're looking for, and generally any hardwood is going to do better than softwoods. Most people like to bend things like oak, and that will give you a fantastic result as well. Here I'm bending a bit of ash. When you're selecting your wood, you want to make sure that you have as clear grain as possible. You don't want any knots, and you don't want too much variation in the grain. Anytime the grain changes direction, that is exactly where the board is going to break during the bending process, so you want as clear wood as possible. Also when you're selecting your wood, you want to try and find quarter sawn material. If you do flat sawn boards, you can get a good result out of that, but you're much more likely to get a much more clean bend if you're getting quarter sawn material. One of the easiest ways to do this is to get something that is flat sawn and only use the outer two edges of your piece. Sometimes this is much easier than just buying quarter sawn material. For a toboggan, it's best to mill your runners down to somewhere between half an inch and three eighths of an inch, and that will not only make it easier to bend the material, but it's also gonna give you the final thickness that you need for the toboggan. Now, depending on what kind of steam box you use and how efficient it is, you're gonna to wanna to put these in for somewhere around an hour to make sure that they have enough moisture in them so that they bend properly. Anytime you're steaming wood, it's not just about making sure that the steam penetrates the wood. That would take forever if that was the only case. We're also trying to heat up all the lignin inside of the wood so that it becomes more pliable. And so it's not just the steam that we're worried about, but also the heat inside the box, making sure that everything is heated up nicely so that everything becomes more moldable. If you are working with slightly drier material, this lignin will actually dry up and sort of act like a dried out piece of leather if you've ever worked with that. It dries up and it cracks and it won't absorb moisture very well. So one of the ways you can fix that a little bit is by pre-soaking your material in water. If you're having troubles getting your wood to bend properly, you can also try adding a little bit of fabric softener into this water as you soak it and that will sort of rejuvenate that material a little bit. Once your material is ready to bend, go ahead and pull it out of the steamer and put it into your form. The way you design this form is also incredibly important. Not only do you want to make sure that you're bending it to the shape that you want, but you also want to put a metal band like this on the back of the board and clamp it into place. That way when you bend things around, all of your bend needs to be in a compression force. You don't want any of it to have a pulling force, otherwise that will also break your piece. I personally also like to drill a bunch of holes into my forms so that I can place clamps anywhere I feel like if I have a specific spot that's bending out more than the rest, that's where I will put the clamp and that will pull everything nice and into shape. One of the things a lot of people talk about with steam bending is that when you pull your piece off of the form that it's going to have a certain amount of spring back, but here's the key to that. If you let your materials dry properly, you won't actually have any spring back. I've done this a handful of times. Once you pull your piece out of the main form, you need to add one of these holding forms to it. And the cool thing about these holding forms is you can leave them on for as long as you want. Generally, I leave these on for about two weeks, but if you're working with green material, you need to leave these on until the wood is completely dry, at least below 10%, ideally somewhere close to 8%, and that's when your runners are actually going to be ready. It's actually a lot better to do this process in the summer, and then when you wait until winter, your runners should be ready by that point. But the absolute coolest thing about this method is you won't get any spring back. You can see as these forms come off, there is zero spring back. And this gives you a much more consistent runner. Now, I don't mean to oversimplify this, but at this point, it just comes down to your basic woodworking techniques. We need to add a couple of cross members to this toboggan to hold everything together, and that's kind of all you're doing. I decided to dress up my toboggan a little bit by using these walnut cross members, and this ended up looking so beautiful by the time I was done. I just had these walnut 1x2s that I cut down to the proper length, and then I rounded over two of the top corners, giving me a beautiful cross member. And then I could go over to the drill press and drill a hole for the rope that I'm going to be installing later. 
Technically, you can skip this part of the process if you want, but adding a beautiful white rope to the toboggan just adds to the features of the toboggan. It looks a hundred times better once you add the rope. I think this was just a half inch hole. And then once all the pieces are created, it's good to go through each of your individual pieces, sanding with a 120 to get all of the marks off of there and make sure everything is running nice and clean. And this is a perfect time to get rid of any imperfections in your runners. When installing the cross members, it's important to remember to pre-drill everything. I decided to drill all the screws in through the back of the sled rather than the top so that you wouldn't see any of the hardware. It's also important to remember that you don't want to use zinc plated screws for this. Because we're talking about snow, we're talking about outside use, you don't want anything that will rust, so it's better to use something that is stainless steel. And now that all of the cross members are in place, this is a perfect time to go through and trim the sled to its final length. I also made up this last piece of walnut to act as an end cap to the top of the sled. This holds the top boards in place, but it also adds a little bit of decoration to the top of the sled. I also cut these cross members just a little bit wide so that I could trim them to final length at this point as well. Now I can go through and sand everything down nice and flush. I went from a 120 grit all the way up to a 320 grit to make sure everything was nice to the touch. I also use this as an opportunity to ease over all of the corners. At this point, it's a good idea to go over the entire bottom of the sled and make sure everything is in the same plane. This will make your sled go much, much smoother. This step will probably take the most time. I probably spent the most time sanding it down with an 80 grit to make sure everything was in plane. And then I went through a 120, sanded the entire surface, and then once again at a 320 to make sure everything was nice and smooth to the touch. And then I needed to drill the last two holes for the ropes. I could have done this earlier over on the drill press, but I wanted to make sure that all of my holes lined it up perfectly. So I figured this was the best time to make a perfectly clean hole all the way through the sled. And now it's time to apply the finish. I decided to do three coats of this polyurethane. And not only does that give you a really nice piece to touch, but it also gives you a perfect surface for putting the wax on the bottom of the sled later. That will come in handy for making sure you can make this sled go as fast as you want. In my opinion, the best type of rope to use for this is actually this white nylon rope. I love this stuff. And it looks absolutely amazing once the sled is all put together with this beautiful shiny white rope. Now I just bought this rope down at my local hardware store but if you want a link I'll be leaving a link to the same stuff down in the description. I ran the rope through all of the bottom runners first and then tied a knot in the end and then after I pull that knot very tight I could cut it to its final length and then burn the end so that it won't come untied. And now at this point I can pull the rope as tight as I possibly can and tie another knot cutting it to length and then burning it as well. You really want this rope to be as tight as possible because it will loosen a little bit as people hold onto the rope going down the hill. They will be yanking on this and they will make the rope just a little bit more loose, so get this as tight as you can. Now it's time to add the loop that's really helpful for holding onto as you're going down the hill, but you also want this to be long enough so that you can carry the sled up the hill. I think I used right around three feet of this for the front of the sled. This rope gets installed in pretty much the exact same way. Although I did put a knot in the rope before I put it through the hole in the sled to make sure it wouldn't move around. Now I designed this sled to be the fastest possible sled that you can create, which means I decided to put a good layer of wax along the bottom. The easiest way to do this is just to get yourself a block of paraffin wax and just rub it on the bottom and then go over it a couple of times with the heat gun and you just keep doing this over and over and over again until you can see a perfectly smooth surface along the bottom. From all of the research I have done over the years, I have found this to be the absolute fastest that you can make a gravity powered sled. The only way to make this faster would be to use some sort of propulsion. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. This was by far one of my favorite projects I have ever done in the shop. I highly recommend doing a project like this at least some point in your career. They are so much fun and kids love this kind of thing. And now the only thing to do is to go out and try out the sled. Thank you all for watching. Catch y'all next time. You are making too much noise. Calm down. Okay, I'm coming down with you.